It's time for the POS show where we talk politics or we talk sports. Here's Joel Sawyer and J.C. Sherbert. It's the POS show. J.C. Sherbert here with you along with Joel Sawyer. Uh, Kind of a new endeavor here, um, the politics or sports show. Uh, And basically it is what it is. We're going to talk about sports and politics or politics or sports. POS show uh, right here. I want to welcome my co-host, uh, Joel Sawyer. Uh, has a long history in politics. Those of you that know me know that I have a long history of sports. Um, so this is going to be quite an interesting endeavor. Uh, so Joel, uh, welcome into the show, and uh, we're ready to get started on our, our first episode of this uh, this new endeavor, which promises to be uh, a barrel of laughs. Oh, it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun, and uh, we're lucky this week, or uh, you know, we're lucky because we have things to talk about. I don't know how lucky uh, America is right now, but we have a pretty awesome intersection of uh, politics and sports in our vice president, Mike Pence, uh, heading to a Colts game on Sunday and then promptly leaving the Colts game. Uh, he said that he was uh, offended by players kneeling for the national anthem. He wasn't going to stay for that, even though it was a big game for the Colts in uh, Indianapolis where Peyton Manning's jersey was going to be retired. A nice little uh, fitting send-off for him. But uh, Mike Pence was having none of it. He was having absolutely none of it. Uh, it was interesting that you know before he even uh, you know before he even went into the stadium, the traveling press was told not to get out of the van uh, because he wasn't going to be there long. So, so JC, do you do you think that this that this might have been a little a little pre planned outrage on uh, on Mike Pence's part? You've got to sit in the van because he's not going to be here for very long. What is that? Sit in the van. He's not going to be here very long. Uh, yeah, and, and you know we live in an outraged society, uh, and I think that a lot of the outrage that we see these d- days is pre-planned, whether that's on social media or by our vice president, who I, th- I think he's a good man. And look, uh, I I've understand. Met him before. I mean, I think yeah. he's a really good dude. I, yeah. I, I understand, you know, the, the the optics of it, and you'll hear me use that word a lot, optics. But at, at some that's point, look. Yes. <laughs> At some point, I think this administration in general needs to get off of optics and get on results. And, you know, was there really a need to do that? I don't know. You know, I, I don't necessarily agree with people kneeling during the national anthem. I think it's a little misguided as far as, you know, what they're actually protesting. But it, I support their right to do it as an American because that's what America is all about. And, and I, I, I don't, I don't think that it's it's very productive for the vice president who needs to be in a position of leadership to go to a game and then turn around and show his butt and leave. I mean, and it, you know, Mike Pence, as much as Mike Pence is going to show his butt, that was a butt showing exercise right there in Indianapolis on Sunday. Yeah, look, I mean, anybody who who has seen anything about the NFL for the past like year knows that if you go to a game, there is going to be at least a guy kneeling for the national anthem. I mean, this strikes me as like, you know, walking into like an adult movie house, like the, where they show pornography and be like, oh, they showed a penis and I'm offended and I'm leaving. Um, this is like, you know, this is going to happen. You walk into a, a, an event where you know that this action that is going to trigger you is going to be taking place. Um, and then you go in and make a big deal about it. I mean, it, it just strikes me as very disingenuous. And, you know, even I was reading this morning some of the conservative media, even like Red State, is kind of like, Mike Pence, give me a break. Yeah. And, and that's a surprise today, specialized media. You know, of course, he got torn apart by CNN and everybody else, you know. And, and, and even CNN, Chris Kaliza, I think is how you say his name. Uh, Saliza was at the, yeah, I'm not going to get any of you know, these, these political guys, you're going to have to correct me on that Joel movie because I'll, I'll, I'm going to butcher some names here coming up. And you can correct me on all the sports names. <laughs> then, yeah. This guy, you know, this <laughs> guy Harry, Harry, mispronouncing sports names never misses a chance in his blog. And I, I think he does a really good job. He did a good job at the Washington post before going there with what he is, but there's going to be a big snarky blog. Uh, about the administration anytime something like this happens. And, and, and it almost was like in his piece today, he was sort of blaming Trump for it. Look at what Donald Trump just did to Mike Pence. <laughs> he, he caused a PR stunt, and people say that they pre-planned it and all. I, I just, you know, the NFL and football in general, um, 
it means so much to our country, and it means a lot to just as many liberals as it does to conservatives and uh, anybody else out there across the political spectrum. I know it's been politicized. And I know there are strong feelings on both sides of this issue, issue, and I certainly have my opinion on it, too. You know, I, I think that the flag is somewhat sacred, the national anthem is sacred, um, but, but I get it. And, and I can't, you know, as a, as a white guy, you know, that's out here, you know, living in a middle class, I don't want to say bubble, but solidly middle class in South Carolina – I, I can't relate. I'm going to admit I can't relate to what they're protesting. You know, I've never been a, a victim of, you know, police discrimination or anything like that. And, and I'm not saying that in all of those cases that that exists. I'm just saying that, you know, I, I can't relate to what they're protesting. And I respect uh, their rights as Americans to go do that, regardless of who it offends and makes mad. And, and I also respect the other side of the argument. And I just think that it's something that the presidency – um needs to kind of, you know, the administration, vice president or president, they need to kind of take the high road on this and just say, all right, hey, yeah, you know, we don't agree with it, but, you know, we don't need to be out here throwing SOBs at players. We don't need to be calling, no. Jer- we don't need to be calling Jerry Jones, and we don't need to be, you know, <laughs> having the vice president show his butt uh, and, and get up and offendedly leave a football game because that just makes the situation that much more tense. It divides the nation that much more. And it, it, it's not helpful. Yeah, no. I mean, and, you know, the, the the president and the vice president have sent out probably, uh, you know, now right now, two dozen more tweets about people standing for flags um, than they have about black men getting shot in the back by police officers. Um, you know, at, at some point, hopefully uh, the, the nation will, will, will turn its, uh, you know, will turn its attention to how black people are being policed in this country. But, um, you know. Maybe uh, I can fly a, a unicorn to the moon, too. I think that you would have a lovely mu- unicorn to take to the moon, Joel. I, I, it, would be, it, would, it would put Rainbow Bright to shame. Yeah. Would you have a space bubble, a glass space bubble helmet? Do they make them our size? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I know uh, they don't when, make them in my size. No, when we eventually add video to this thing, um, <laughs> you're going to see we, we've got some, some big-ass heads. Gigantic. They're full of, they're full of brain power. <laughs> Lots of knowledge in this head. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the thing. You hit the nail on the head there. I mean, it's a situation where I think all sides of this subject, and, and, and I think a lot of folks our age, Joel, and we're both uh, 40, you know, we're both Generation Xers. I, I think we all kind of thought that maybe, you know, with, with the during the time period we grew up in the 90s, uh, you know, I'm sure there were underlying racial issues, but it seemed like we were kind of past all that. And, and I think that's what's disappointing about today. Now, maybe we weren't. But but I no, was under I, the I impression think the we were. The difference is that there weren't smartphones. Um, is is because you know now that there are body cams and smartphones, you have a smartphone in the palm of everybody's hand. Like we were able to see firsthand the stuff that African Americans are experiencing like every friggin' day with police officers, right? And, and so I, I think that I think it's like in, in part an awareness thing because you know a point I made the other night is is like if I see like as a white guy if I see this many videos now. Like, what was it like when police weren't afraid of being recorded? Mm. I, and it, it's, it's really scary to think about. Um, but um, like I said, I mean, you know, hopefully folks will get back to that issue at some point. Um, but it's a, a huge, just going to be a huge political football. Haha, <laughs> no pun intended God. right now. <laughs> yeah, I know that was friggin' terrible. Um, and so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll move on to bigger and better things. Yeah. And, and the day Peyton Manning gets his jersey retired, Peyton Manning to me, um, you know, glad he won the Super Bowl his last year. There's a guy that went out on top. Uh, there's a guy I got a lot of respect for, especially like his Saturday night live skits. I thought they were hilarious. I think the guy's got a future as an actor or a coach, or he can just sit there and count his money. He can bathe in his money if he wants to, but Peyton Manning, really good guy. It's unfortunate. I feel for him. The, the day his jersey's retired, and, and the, Colt, the Colts were terrible from the time they moved to Baltimore to the time they went to Indy. They were, they were not a good franchise. Peyton Manning made that franchise into a Super Bowl champion. Indianapolis in general, if you look at, you know, beyond the, 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 the big race they have there every year, they haven't had a great history. The Pacers are not that good. You know, the, the Colts have been, you know, good under Manning, but, you know, weren't good – before since they moved from Baltimore, yeah. you know, so I, you know, it's a, it's a shame that, you know, the, to me that would, that's about football and, and you go and do something like that and further politicize it when it's already being politicized. 
Uh, and, and I think that's a shame. And, and I think that, you know, flag protest in general, I get it. it, it this is the United States of America. We're, we are, we're allowed to protest under our Constitution, uh, and it guarantees us to do that. You know, that's fine with me. But you're, you're right, Joel. It needs to be a facilitator for a larger discussion that nobody seems to want to have. Nobody yeah, wants to talk no, about it. I mean, come on. I mean, get, get everybody in a room and talk. Because, uh, again, as Americans, that's what we do. We don't have an ass-showing contest where, oh, he showed his ass, so now I'm going to show my ass even better. And, and it's like that game where you, where you try to grab a hold of the baseball bat, and all of a sudden you're out of bat, and, and you still got a, a, a catastrophe on your hands as far as, you know, the, 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 the way things are viewed in our country. So that's... That's my little thing there, and, uh, you know, not meaning to get up on a soapbox or anything, but I, I just thought the whole thing was extremely, extremely unfortunate. But, hey, welcome to 2017 in the United States of America. And in, uh, in the foreseeable future in politics, unless, you know, something better happens, and, and I don't know what that is yet. I have no idea what that is. I thought it well, was I mean, John Kasich for a while, but that was just me. <laughs> I, I think we got a you know moving on to our political topics. I think we got a pretty good preview of what that could look like. With uh, we're calling it Corker Uncorked. Um, Bob Corker, the senator from Tennessee, has decided he's not going to run for reelection. And a, and a funny thing happens when people don't run for reelection; they can start actually saying like what they really think and things that are true uh, because they don't have to worry about. Uh, offending people or guaranteeing the fact that they're going to get, you know, 50 plus one voters uh, in in their next election. You know, so, so Bob Corker has been, I mean, for politics, kind of unleashing against Donald Trump, saying, you know, that it's like a reality show, uh, that he's going to incite World War Three. Uh, I mean, he's saying like what he really thinks. This is this is a Republican chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Um, and you know, it, it's, it's a market change in tone from, uh, when he thought he might be running for reelection to when he was like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to serve this term. I'm out. I'm going to start speaking truth to power. Um, I, I think it's the, you know, if, if we can preach for about one little reform, we think we might need is term limits. Um, when, when there are no term limits, when you can stay in there theoretically forever, the name of the game is staying in the game. And so you're, you're very constrained and bound by, well, what message polls well? I don't want to take risk. I want to do what polls well. I want to do uh, you know, what's going to guarantee me the most votes next time around because they're worried about you know, the politics is their job. Um, you know, Bob Corker said, I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. And, you know, it's, it's really emboldened him. Yeah, and, and that, you hit the nail on the head. That you, you touched on something very interesting. And look, he said some. In, I mean, he he did an interview with the New York Times where basically unloaded on Trump, unloaded on the administration. Said some people think there's a good cop, bad cop thing going on. He's like, that's just not true. Every day at the White House is, you know, people are people trying to restrain the president, all that good stuff. Um, but you hit the nail on the head, and this is interesting, Joel, because this is my theory about why Trump got elected. Some people are going to sit there and say Trump got elected because white America is racist and hates immigrants. And while I think that it's true that, you know, a, a large number of people who have racist views did vote for Donald Trump and bought into, you know, some of the stuff that he said, I think it goes beyond that. I think our, the general people in this country um, were, are tired of politicians. And, and I think the fundamental reason for that is the – the way Congress operates, and you hit the nail on the head as far as it's all about getting reelected. It's all about self-preservation and self-survival and not rocking the boat and getting those votes every two years or every six years. Um, and so nothing gets done. I, and I had a buddy that, uh, I guess, I, I don't know if I'd call him a buddy. He was kind of a, a work acquaintance. He used to be a, a football coach and then ran for Congress and was elected. And we got to talking one day at an all-star game about – his experience in Washington, D.C., and he said, it's all about getting reelected. Nobody cares about doing anything uh, except getting reelected, pandering to their voters, whatever. And, and I just don't know that that's good for the country, you know, because you, you almost have this, I don't want to call it a cottage industry, but a, a gigantic machine that's based, that functions like a business. And it's like, you know, they're about their business and their jobs and their employment and all that. When it's really you're supposed to be, you know, representing the American people. I mean, that, that's right. what you're supposed and, to be, making, making decisions, you know? 
Yeah, and, and it's and it's actually one step worse in in today's uh, you know in today's electoral environment because you have districts that are gerrymandered so badly that that it is impossible for a Republican to win in November or it is impossible for a Democrat to win in November. That means for you know probably uh, probably 360, 370 of the seats of the 435 seats in Congress. Like we know going in, whether it's going to be a Republican or a Democrat, mm-hmm. right? So you actually have a system right now that rewards inflexibility, that rewards not compromising, because if your district is going to be decided in a Republican primary, right? So you're a congressional district congressman, Congressman Sherbert. Uh, you are a, a Republican. Yeah. Look, all congressional, all, all leadery. <laughs> so, so, so you're a Republican, and you and so you get elected. You go up to Washington D.C. and you're like, mm, you know what? I'm going to get things done. And then you shockingly realize that that requires like you know compromising a little bit, not mm-hmm. getting everything that you want, giving Democrats a couple of things that they want. And all of a sudden, you go back home to run for re-election, and it's not going to be Democrats you're afraid of. It's going to be other Republicans, that you're a rhino, that you cater to the Democrats, that you're a Nancy Pelosi Republican. A <laughs> Nancy so, Repo- What does that look like? <laughs> it's terrible is what it does. Go ahead. No, but I mean, so, so but that, but that's what you're up against. So if if you come from a, a reliably Republican district, um, from you know, in in terms of the, the self preservation you were talking about, you are rewarded for not compromising, for being as conservative as possible, and for not getting anything done. And the exact same thing is true of the Democrat side. The exact same thing is true on the Democrat side. If Democrats are going in and compromising with, with Republicans in, in democratically safe districts, they're, they're going to get killed in the primary back on. So, you know, we have a system where politicians draw the districts, they pick their voters, and they actually reward themselves by being as inflexible and as extreme as they possibly can. Which is sad because that's just not what America's built on. And if you look at, you know, and people can debate this all they want, who, who were the two most successful presidents probably, you know, since you and I have been alive, Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton. And what did both of those guys do? They compromised. Right. You know, Reagan right. would always give the Democrats a little something, hash things out. Clinton, you know, worked with the Republican Congress uh, on a lot of issues, and, and, and they were successful. And when those guys finished their eight-year term, we all kind of looked back and went, hey, those guys did a pretty good job. That a boy, right. you know, and, and I think I think that that's there's just not that spirit in Washington anymore. Speaking of getting things done, this Republican Congress uh, very much so represents the Miami Dolphins on offense right now. Oh, absolutely. Dolphins absolutely. have the worst offense in the NFL, um, just not getting anything done. And it seems to me, Joel, as we move on to some more political topics here, you know, with tax reform, health care, all these things they're trying to do. That, that there is no desire by Mitch McConnell, Paul Ryan, any of the leadership to do anything but force the bills through by using reconciliation um, and kind of skewing the rules to where they don't have to have but a, a simple majority to pass it. And, and to me, w- w- with issues this big, I, I think, quite frankly, we need bipartisan support. We need to hash out a deal. Uh, and, and it just seems like, you know, there's no desire on the part of the Republican leadership um, in Congress right now uh, to hash out a deal. And, and I, I think that, you know, being an extreme moderate like I am, I'd like to see them hash out a deal on these very, very big issues. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm old school. I remember a time when Republicans wouldn't cut taxes until they cut spending by uh, by, by the same amount. But that's. Um, I think gone are those, those days. I mean, we're not going to get, you know, and, and I'm a I'm a hawkish fiscal conservative, and I, I don't like the tax reform bill because we're not paying for it. Like, we're not cutting spending to go with it. You can't cut tax. That's what conservatism used to be. And now it's just like bogus populism. It's like, okay, let, let's come up with a tax reform package that is going to appeal to the most people in my Republican district. Got it? Good. Let's go. Democrats don't need them. Just pass it. Um, and, and you know, and in fairness to the Republicans, this is the exact same approach that uh, you know that, that Pelosi and the Democrats took when Obama was first elected back in 2008. From, they had a solid majority from 08 to 10, 
and they ram things through the exact same way. So, you know, it's it's not a it's not an approach that's, you know, unique to the Republican Party, but there's no impact from the, you know, there's no input from the other side on on tax reform. And you mentioned health care reform too. You know, the the the, the entire health care reform uh, ha, has been a joke for for a couple of reasons. You know, one because I, I think it was like 22 times they voted to repeal Obamacare <laughs> when they knew that President Obama would veto it, and now that you have a president that would sign it, we're like, whoa, we don't, we don't want to repeal Obamacare. There's there's things in that that some people like, right? So. <laughs> Let's leave it mostly intact and then just uh, let's kick some poor people off Medicaid and uh, we'll call it a day. How about it? Uh, That's basically the extent of health care reform. It's like, oh, all these things from Obamacare that people like, we're going to keep that. Um, we have to do something conservative. Everybody thinks we hate poor people anyway. Let's, uh, let's kick them off Medicaid and uh, we'll be good to go. And, and there, there's, no actual, there's no actual effort to, like, talk to the other side or, or go back to the old, you know, conservative healthcare reform playbook that, you know, people like Newt Gingrich used to talk about back in the day when ideas actually mattered and, and come up with an actual healthcare reform system that addresses cost. Um, it, it's just more, you know, m- more talking points. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think much of anything that is, that is, is going to happen that's going to really affect the health insurance uh, market as it stands right now. Here's the thing, too, with Obamacare is that I think that, you know, when you look at the the numbers, most people that have insurance still have it through their job. Um, The expansion of of Medicaid, uh, I think, was a net positive because the the whole purpose of Obamacare was to, you know, help poor people and help elderly people that that couldn't afford skyrocketing premiums. And and then there's a small portion of us, and and I'm one of these people, Joel, um, self-employed have to go get insurance themselves you know and you know look i'm not happy with the premium i pay or my deductible i think it's ridiculous but here's the thing that that really wasn't the point of the law people like me are not a large percentage of the population yes it's a pain in the butt yes i wish it didn't cost so much yes 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 but when you look at the 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 poor people and the older people and the pre people with pre-existing conditions and the things that the law in, in its original form was meant to help um you know hey look the rest of us can kind of figure something out you know whether that's you know going with more free market principles to fix it or or whatever we can figure that out but don't throw poor people off the health care i mean you've already expanded it i mean that's the biggest problem i have with any republican solution is that it dices up medicare medicare well and and there's a there's a thing that a lot of people don't know about in this and i'll I'll put on my policy wall all cat for a second is that when when Obamacare passed, there used to be this thing called uh, DISH. It was called disproportionate share, and basically what that was is when when community hospitals treated um, uh, indigent patients that couldn't pay, the federal government would cut them a check based upon how many indigent patients they saw that year. Right. Mm-hmm. So Obamacare did away with that under the theory that oh everybody's going to have health insurance now under Obamacare. Uh, and, and so it, it expanded access. Uh, so that's, that goes to, you know, why I don't necessarily have a big problem with the Medicaid uh, e- expansion is because, like, you know, that was more or less dealt with by getting rid of DISH. The problem with Obamacare and the reason I've always hated the law is because it gives us health insurance access at the expense of cost. And think about this for a second. You have these big insurance pools. But you let kids stay on their parents' insurance until they're 26 years old, right? So you have nothing but, or I should say nothing but, but you have an older, sicker population going into these pools, no young people going into these pools. So what's that going to do? It's going to spike the hell out of premiums. So yeah, I can get insurance, but it's not going to be much good if they don't address uh, you know, some reforms that are going to bring costs down in, in the long run. And we, and we, you know, we could do a whole show on health yeah. reform. I mean, and yeah, and then the, the kids all up until you're 26 is very politically popular. And so they're, they're under no circumstances or they're going to fix that or, or whatever. So uh, it, it's an interesting thing. What I would do is just keep the Medicaid expansion and do away with the rest of the thing, you know, and implement – you know, some free market things, you know, allow organi- trade organizations and, and, and people like that to pool and, and get insurance and all that and try to try to fix it and stabilize it. But it's a mess. You know, as for tax reform, I, I think that the fundamental problem 
is that we've had some dishonesty about it, uh, not necessarily you know coming out of the White House, but you know out of some other people. I mean, it does not, it's not a middle class tax reform or tax cut. It, it's a situation where some in the middle class are going to be you know able to to save on, on their taxes. Um, I, I don't agree with cutting it. You know, you mentioned the deficit. I don't agree with cutting the top rate from thirty nine to thirty five. I do think that the people with um, the small business owners, you know, cutting their taxes will probably help with job creation. Um, but, you know, it, it's just a situation where, you know, once again, you're repealing the estate tax and all this other stuff. You know, a lot of that stuff is unfair, you know, as far as, you know, sure. you, you shouldn't have, you know, just you're penalizing the rich. The rich have been vilified in our country to, to a certain extent, especially lately, because you have people like Bernie Sanders out there. But, um you know, I, it, it's a deal where I, I just think that, you know, with the, the political climate right now and with what they can and cannot get from Democrats, you know, there probably just needs to be a focus on the middle class and, and, and give them some tax relief and worry about everybody else later. You know, your thoughts. I mean, I, you know, look, I, I think that if we're going to if, if we're going to cut taxes and not pay for like my thing is like I don't ever want to cut a tax if we're not going to pay for it. I don't want to cut taxes just for the sake of cutting taxes. But I, I think that it ought to be aimed at spurring innovation and spurring wealth creations and actually creating jobs. Um, you know, giving a middle class family, you know, five hundred dollars a year off their tax bill, as good as that sounds and as happy as it will make people, it, it's it's not ultimately going to boost the economy in any significant way. So, you know, what, what I would look toward is more toward an incubation tax credit, bringing down the corporate rate, which I know everybody hates because corporations are evil. But, uh, you know, we, we have so many corporations that are that are offshore right now and, you know, sheltering income outside of America. And, and I'm just thinking, you know, if you look at what Ireland did when they lowered their corporate tax rate, I mean, it, it it's ultimately a net positive by lowering that rate because you have people... Uh, repatriating a lot of that money. So, you know, those are a couple of things. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a tax policy expert by any by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it looks to me like more of the same old stuff that's going to, you know, make people happy because they see a, you know, they see a little bit of a difference in their check, but it's not really going to do anything for the economy. Ireland Tower. We're going to cut all of your taxes and you bring your taters back to the rolling hills of the green hills over here and we're going to boost our economy. I <laughs> repatriating the potatoes. Yeah, no doubt about it. There's no tater famine over there in Ireland. Now anymore. the downside to what Ireland did, just to put my nerd hat back on for a second, but when they, but when the the economy tanked in like you know 2009 or whatever, um, it hit Ireland like really really hard because they didn't have a broad tax base. Mm. Um, you know, but uh, every, everything you point to is a success story. Somebody can find a turd in the punch bowl somewhere. There's always turds in the punch bowl. Speaking of which, you know, Nick Saban, as we transition back and put the S back in the POS show in sports. Let's put the S back in the POS. All right, all right so this, this is interesting. You know, Nick Saban, I think, is a national treasure. I mean, I, I, I've, you know, sometimes if I need some motivation, I'll pull up a Nick Saban speech like he gives it, a, like he's giving it a camp or something where he talks about take care of your business. And I, I think that there are too many people that aren't like Nick Saban these days. Um, as far as what he values and, and sort of all that, he gets a, he gets really criticized, man, because he's on top. And when you're on top, you get criticized no matter what. Like you said, the old turd in the punch bowl. So Nick Saban's team goes to Texas A&M last week, and, and they were up by about 15, 12, 15 points, and A&M cut it to eight late. And, you know, eight, for A&M, it was kind of a moral victory. I don't think anybody expected them to hang with the Tide. Uh, who's the number one team in the country right now? But you know, it wasn't wasn't a beautiful performance by Alabama, which Alabama's been. I think they beat Vanderbilt fifty nine nothing and Ole Miss sixty six to three before they went out to A and M. So obviously the Aggies gave them a little bit of challenge. So Nick Saban goes off on the media afterwards <laughs> and says that the praise that his players get in the media and his team gets in the media, it's like rat poison. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a. Um, Hardcore didn't type he even of like modify it with rat. He first he was like poison. He was like rat poison. Rat poison. I mean, it's just <laughs> you know I, I don't know. But that's uh, I thought it was interesting that he said that. And, and you know he 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 hints around about things like that a lot. Like he doesn't like anything positive being written about his team. But then again, I've seen him go off when some of the negatives written about his team. So I I don't know kind of what he expects. But that's just you know in today's 
I guess, specialized media environment. I think we all try to consume media that appeals to our beliefs and, you know, the teams we pull for and all that, very customized. You know, I can see where he's getting it because, you know, some of the guys on the beat out there, they have to kind of be positive when, you know, when things are going well, even if they don't look beautiful when they win because, hey, you know, that they won and you don't want to alienate your dwindling readership base. So I, I thought that was just kind of interesting that he chose those terms. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, the media has always been a been a pinata for, for politicians, and you know, to a degree for, uh, for for coaches, for sports coaches as well. The you know the the interesting thing now is like what you alluded to that you have the specialized media. So if you read something that's uh, that's down the middle and dare I say truthful and accurate, and you don't want to believe it, you know, in about two seconds on the internet, you can find something that confirms what you already believe, right? So, you know, if, if you think that Nick Saban is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you can find it pretty easily. If you think that, he, you know, that he's a cheating idiot, you can find that pretty easily as well. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's the media bashing combined with, you know, I think that this, uh, you know, this confirmation bias that people have to read media that they, that they want to believe. Exactly. Now, one thing that's not biased is a uh, hundred and – I think 8,000 in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan this past weekend, Michigan and Michigan State. And, oh, man, you know, if you're Mark D'Antonio and and, and the Michigan State Spartans, I mean, you just – you have to be feeling good. You know, I thought Michigan – Michigan hadn't looked good at times this year, but, you know, losing at home to Michigan State, that makes Jim Harbaugh one and four against the Spartans and Ohio State combined since he's been back to Michigan – and man, what a what a victory for Michigan State over the Wolverines! Fourteen to ten was the final. Um, has to be kind of a like you mentioned, you know, turds in the punch bowl. Uh, there's a big maize and blue punch bowl with a green turd in it right now uh, up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It's, it's very descriptive. Mi- Michigan, I, I cannot stand. It, they are the Bernie Sanders of, of college football, and anybody that knows me knows that that's not a compliment. They look good on on the surface, but when you actually start digging into them, Michigan fans, you are not an elite program anymore. You haven't been since the '80s. You're you're ten and three, a couple of years in a row with Harbaugh in a pretty good conference. You're not that great, and Michigan shows it. Michigan State has shown it to you three of the past four years. And then yeah, Michigan State went three and nine last season, sort of in a rebuilding situation, and. Uh, you know, they haven't been overly impressive, and they go in there and get another big win. And you remember two years ago, Joel, you know, they I think they fumbled a, they fumbled a punt, and Michigan State returned it for a touchdown. I mean, they just can't seem to win. Have to feel bad for them. Um, you know, hey, I, I'm a big Harbaugh fan, um, and I, I do like interacting with Michigan's fans sometimes. But, man, that's just got to be really, really tough in those big games uh, when you're talking about the Wolverines. Um, you know – there's more dumb acidry out there uh, these days. Is uh, one of Mi- uh, Miami, the Miami Dolphins. We mentioned the Dolphins before, worst offense in the NFL. And uh, I feel bad because it seems like Dolphin fans every single year. This is the year. This is the year we're going to be better. And it's just not. It's a it's a good franchise that has a lot of support and all that. But man, they just can't uh, can't this seem to get it done. Better. We've and, got Jay Cutler this year. Everything's fine. Oh man. Woo. What a terrible, terrible um, deal. All right, so Chris Forrester, um, the uh, offensive line coach uh, for the Dolphins, uh, there's a video with uh, him doing lines of a white powdery substance. Um, rolled up at a $20 bill, thanks to a Las Vegas model, releasing the video he took himself. Um, you know... And he said, how about me going into a meeting and doing this before I go? Uh, the head coach said he was unaware of the problem. I mean, dude, this is just a – this is a dumbass. This is the – I mean, what are you doing? What are you doing? I mean, you're an NFL assistant coach. You coach at the highest level of football. You have to know something about X's and O's to get that far in your career. Because in the NFL, it's all about ball. You don't have to recruit. There, there are no people skating by – you know, like in college, you may have a guy that is a pretty good recruiter, pretty good motivator, that type of thing, But and he's part of your organization. But, you, you know, he, if you can't coach, you can't coach in the NFL. 
What are you doing? Get putting somebody on video take you. I mean, what? That's just that's just ridiculous, and it just adds to another embarrassing chapter uh, in that franchise's recent history. I mean, it, it was embarrassing enough they signed Jay Cutler, and now you get this happening, and you have the worst offense in the league, and it's just not looking too good uh, right now as far as the optics go for the Miami Dolphins. No, it's. I mean, it's terrible, and this is like you said. I mean, this is just a dumbass thing to do. Um, it's it's not going to help the organization, and and, and you know, I suspect this uh, Forrester fellow isn't going to have a job too much longer today. Oh no, they they definitely actually just came across. They did they fired him. <laughs> oh, cool. you, you're fired, but uh, so yeah, I just I, it. But some people just don't. I mean, they can't stand, can't get out of their own way. And, um, you know, obviously if this guy's got a serious problem, you know, I hope he gets the help he needs. But my goodness, I mean, come on, come on, come on. All right, so it's time for this week's True Champion segment. We're going to talk about um, a, we're going to name one true champion. It could be a political guy. It could be a sports guy. It's going to be a sports guy this week because this guy, to me, uh, is a is a hero of mine. <laughs> Uh, Mike Leach, the head coach of the Washington State Cougars, um, one of the most interesting guys in all of college football. He'll sit there and rant about this, rant about that, loves pirates, uh, had, a, had a skeleton. I don't get the loving pirates thing. but He I does love it. His book's called Swing Your Sword. He had, a, he had a skeleton in his office at Texas Tech with a pirate hat on it. Mr. Bones. Mr. Bones, I'll throw back. Mr. Bones. <laughs> nah, but um, anyway, Washington State, uh, you know, they had a game last Friday night, which I'm against college football playing on Friday night, especially any games of significance. But they played on Friday night, and they played SC, Southern Cal, and they beat them. And nobody knew about it because it was on a daggum Friday night. Um, so he turns around this week. They go to Oregon, and they win 33-10. to 10. Now, here, here's what the X factor is for Washington State right now. They're playing defense. You know, and when if you're a Pac-12 team and you can put points up, you know, and you're playing defense, you have a chance to win, you know, a lot of games. And 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 that's good. You know, Washington State has an underrated fan base. I had a chance to go to Pullman, gosh, I guess about four years ago in the summertime. Um, and, of course, Washington's really good as well. You know, people in the Pacific Northwest love football. And so hats off to Mike Leach, the true champion for this week's POS show. Arg. And, and I suspect going forward that most of our true champions will probably be uh, uh, sports related rather than politics related because, I mean, let's face it, you've seen politics lately. Yeah, they're, they're runner up. Runner up could probably be Bob Corker this week, but uh, <laughs> I think Mike Leach is, is definitely the true champion. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, time to wrap it up now with our hot takes segment. Um, where we have hot takes uh, on a number of topics, that, but they're always politics or sports related. First and foremost, this kind of crossed the line. Cam Newton uh, said last week, Carolina Panthers quarterback, when um, he was asked by a reporter for the Charlotte Observer um, about route running, he said, it's funny to hear a female talk about route running. Okay, so immediately there's outrage. I mean, And Joel, I think Twitter is ground zero for our outrage culture because – it, it it takes nothing to get on there. And, and look, the, the president does the same thing. So you know, there, there's no big great examples being set. You know, he, he, you know, you get on Twitter and just ah, gripe, 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 and so everybody's outraged. And look, what Cam said was inappropriate. You know, I know plenty of female sports writers. They'll do a great job. You know, that was that was just sort of one of those things that you know I, I'm sure he wishes he had back. So there's all this outrage. Well, then the next day. Somebody goes through her Twitter account and goes back like five years, and, and there were some sort of semi—I I don't want to say semi—they were kind of racially tinged tweets, and they published those. And this is everybody's outraged at her. There's all this outrage, 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 outrage. So there's two lessons here. Number one, Cam, don't say things like that. You're, you're going to hurt your brand, and and, and you, you you always you have over the years to a certain extent not learned how to kind of keep your trap shut on situ on some certain things um and, and and i respect you and think that you know that's part of who you are but don't say things like that and, and number two if you're in journalism or in any kind of thing in the public eye go scrub your twitter account man get that off because somebody these days i think it's kind of a punk move to go back that far but hey look it's fair game somebody's going to find it and then you're going to have to be apologizing for something that you know you've probably forgotten about. So so go scrub those Twitter accounts and Cam Newton, you're better than that. 
Yeah, and when somebody screws up, instead of manufacturing outrage, just say, hey, man, do better. Yeah, do better. (laughs) Moving on to our next hot take, the SEC West is the Republican Party of college football. You have, like, Alabama at the top, uh, you know, clearly in charge. A lot of people don't like them. And then everybody else is just kind of there. I mean, JC, what's going on with the, the SEC West this year? I mean, LSU getting beat by Troy. Yeah, it, 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 well, it was the strongest division in college football. But what you have is you, you got LSU that, that they kind of, of course, they beat Florida this weekend. So I don't know what that says about the East, but you know LSU kind of is off. I, I think Auburn, even though they lost to Clemson earlier, they're about to get it going. I think they're clearly the second best team. But after those two, Joel, you know, th- this was two years ago. We were talking about how great it was. The the number seven team in the division was great and good and all that. And, and now you just kind of have Alabama. And then Alabama's, you know, buddy Auburn, there he's trying to kind of come to the party. And then everybody else is bad. And what's happened is you have a situation where Ole Miss is going into the abyss right now because of the NCAA situation. They have an interim coach. They're not very good at all. You've got issues at Arkansas right now. Mississippi State looked like a promising team, and then all of a sudden they get whacked in the face with a gigantic noodle against Georgia and then against Auburn. You know, they're trying to kind of crawl back. Um, Texas A and M, you know, had a spirited showing uh, against Bama, but you know, and they're talented, but they got a true freshman quarterback, and you know, we'll see what they do. I think it's still a tough division, but but you're right, you're just kind of like looking up, and you're going, well, there's the guy, and or the, there's the number one leader, and you know, very polarizing, and then you got uh, everybody else, and they're just kind of there. So, blah 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 blah. We mentioned earlier the Republican Congress is uh, a lot like the Miami Dolphins offense. And, and I think that whenever you have a bad offense in football, Joel, the number one problem from a schematic standpoint normally is you're not creative and you can't think outside of the box. When your offensive coordinators get fired, nine times out of ten it's because they're not creative. I think it's the same thing with the Republican Congress. They want to do things like how they want to do them. As you said, they're going to serve their constituents. And it makes for very, very boring football even political football, and and, and I, you know, I don't know that I would describe the atmosphere in Washington as boring right now, just because of who the president is. But if you look at Congress, same old thing, same old thing, over and over and over. Run it up the middle. Let's run it off tackle. Let's play action. Let's do this. Well, the game evolves. The country evolves. I think you need to evolve. Get a little more creativity, a little more spirit of compromise, and some different ideas out there. Otherwise, you're going to be 31st in the league and suck, suck, suck for the rest of your term. We get, we get, you know, we get the leaders we deserve, and Congress isn't going to evolve until the electorate revolves. So until the electorate demands better, we're going to be stuck with the same old Congress. Um, you know, the next thing I'd add: throwing things at disaster victims is never a good look. I'm looking at you, Donald Trump in Puerto Rico, and I'm looking at you, Eli Manning in the Giants' offense. Ooh. Jesus Christ. It is. Oh, man. That, those were two big, big debacles. You know what, too? I wouldn't have had a problem with Trump throwing anything. If he hadn't been throwing paper towels, what the hell is a paper towel going to do to somebody who's like thirsty and hungry and their home doesn't have power and water? You, what, what are you going to do with those paper towels, man? And, and like, you know, this, this is the whole issue. This is one of the biggest issues with Trump. I think a lot of his wounds are self inflicted because I don't think anybody around him can or is willing to say, hey, the optics here are not good, Mr. President. Throwing paper towels at folks that are in Puerto Rico that are a victim of a disaster, the optics just aren't good. Same thing with Eli Manning. The optics around that offense are not very good right now if you're the New York football giants. No, it's, uh, it's, it's terrible. Uh... Uh, you wanted to add something about uh, the Facebook interference and uh, oh the God. college basketball recruiting. It's absurd that the FBI is looking at Russian interference in the elections and college basketball recruiting all at the same time. Like, what do you think the priority is there? I, I think they could be looking into Russian interference into college basketball recruiting. You know, I think Vladimir Putin's probably a big Louisville fan. I love that Rick Patino. He's a good guy. Let's get him on that. No, no, no. But it's just kind of interesting that all that came out. Of course, college basketball recruiting, uh, they sort of got um, arrested some coaches and, and some things like that. And, and it's something that for years, Joel, since I've been covering college athletics, 
you always hear about basketball recruiting and how dirty it is and all this other stuff. So it, it, I don't think it comes as a complete shock. Hopefully they clean that up. But speaking of Russia, you know, I've been following this Russian interference thing. You know, I think it's unfortunate that they interfered into the campaign. I think it's unacceptable for any country to do the United States of America. But he, he, here's the thing, you know, beyond the serious stuff that the, the independent council is investigating, which there may or may not be anything there. We're starting to talk now about Facebook ads and like fake blog posts and fake news and all this other stuff. And, and, and I'm just I'm, I'm astonished that, you know, people like Adam Schiff uh, are sitting there talking about oh, they bought Facebook ads and they, they they wrote these fake blogs that were not news. You know, James Comey said it best when he said, yeah, how do you counteract something like that? He's like, well, you kind of need a, a troll army to you know, counteract it. And I just can't believe that, you know, the greatest country on the planet, we're sitting here talking about how a bunch of internet trolls that just so happen to be from Russia, but they could have been from anywhere. They could have been from Gaffney, South Carolina. They could have been from, you know, Bakersfield, California. They could have been from anywhere in the country. You know, it's not that hard to buy a Facebook ad. It's not that hard to put up a blog where you can write any damn thing you want. It's not that difficult. You know, and, and, and I don't know that you can necessarily stop that. You know, I think you could stop it by having an electorate that, you know, maybe kind of looks beyond that a little bit and, and maybe isn't as, um, you know, quick to look at headlines and, and fake news and things like that and swallow it as the truth. But, I mean, like you said, you can believe, you can find something that matches up with your beliefs, no problem. Um, but I, I just I just can't believe that, you know, there's all these government investigations into Russia or Russian actors buying buying face. I mean, I go buy a Facebook ad tomorrow. You know, it's not that hard. I mean, I've built businesses doing that. I mean, it's just it's insane that people are like, (gasps) you know, outraged by this because it's it's just so easy to do. Yeah, look, propaganda is only effective when people are dumb enough to believe it. And if people are dumb enough to believe propaganda that they're reading on Facebook. then our country gets what it deserves. Uh, you, speaking of people who are not buying the propaganda right now, Tennessee fans and Butch Jones. Butch Jones, you are a football coach. You are not a life coach. You're not the champion. You're not paid to be the champions of life that you said last year. You're paid to be the champions of football. And what was it today? He said something about that you don't have to take physical reps. You can take leadership reps. Leadership oh, well, reps. Maybe, Maybe that'll help you score some leadership touchdowns or some leadership field goals or or have some leadership defense, Butch. Listen, coach friggin' football. Don't sit up there like Sun Tzu or whoever the hell you're trying to be and try to dispense life advice. I know, man, and it just makes things worse and worse. The on-field product's not been good for the Vols. You know, 41-0 loss at home to Georgia a couple of weeks ago. Um, haven't really played all that well all year. Their offense is a train wreck uh, a lot of the time. And, and you know, it, it comes back to Butch Jones. I think that the pressures of this job are getting to him. He went off on the media the other day about how negative they were. I mean, it was one of the worst losses they've ever taken at Neyland Stadium. Um, you know, then tried to say that the last three years have been some of the best in the last 20 years of Tennessee football. Well, you know what? They won a national championship in 1998. They won the SEC right. East as recently as 2007. I, I think that shows a disconnect as far as the uh, the standards of that football program goes. And so I just um, – I don't know, old Butch. You know, he's got South Carolina this weekend, so we'll see what they do there. They lose that game. It's, it's going to get really, really ugly in Knoxville. And uh, leadership reps and, you know, that allow you to be a life champion, that's all well and good. But um, I don't think that the Tennessee fan base really wants to hear it. Um, and, and you know what? One, one thing too. We'll get back to our president here for a second, and we'll wrap up the hot takes. You know, if Donald Trump were an offensive coordinator, I think he'd run nothing but trick plays. And, and sure, it's going to be really entertaining, but you're not going to win very often, and it's not a really sound strategy. I, I think that you know the symbolism there is. I, I think this whole thing and is being run too much like a reality show. There, there's too much out there that's like a paper tiger that, oh, we're going to do this, that, and the other, and then you, you read the policies and it doesn't they're not backed up. Uh, I don't know whether that's appealing to your base or, or trying to placate whoever out there. You know, I, I, I thought, and I think a lot of other people thought like I did, 
that, you know, if this country elects a non-politician, the non-politician will not act like a politician and will compromise and get things done. But I, I, I don't even think, you know, compromising is a ways off. You have to have kind of a fundamental understanding of the fact that you can't run trick plays over and over again before you're going to punch it into the end zone. So, yeah, here's hoping that uh, the Donald can kind of um, – you know, get coached up a little bit and do a little better and, and maybe start getting some compromising uh, going with regards to the future of our country because the last few weeks I've just been very, very – actually, you know, since January I've, I've kind of been waiting for this to happen and it just doesn't happen. Yeah, uh, you, if he was an offensive coordinator, he'd run nothing but trick plays. Uh, he would probably also accuse his opponents of uh, dishonesty when they were showing zone and played man instead and then <laughs> claimed that he won even when he lost. Um, yeah, that's the, uh, I think if we can get the Donald into uh, coaching football and, and Butch Jones into the white house, our country might be better off. Well, I tell you what, we'd all be champions of life then. All right. <laughs> that wraps up our first edition of the POS show where we talk politics or sports every week. Uh, for Joel Sawyer, this has been JC Sherbert. Thanks for listening. Uh, we hope you listen again and, uh, tune in as we'll have more zany takes on these ever-evolving worlds that tend to collide and also actually have a lot of crossover in terms of, um, you know, a lot of things these days. All right, Joel, we'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, listening, guys. Talk to you soon.